All right, great. <clears throat> so well, today I'm gonna, it's gonna be a little bit different of a talk uh, and it's really to sort of give you a, a working model for how to think about pursuing your academic careers. Um, so um, everybody can see my screen. All right, um, so, so again, this is gonna be sort of a, uh, I'm gonna use myself as a case example, but, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to, um, whoops. Sorry, I, I'm losing, there we go. Now I can see everybody. I couldn't see anything. Um, all right, so, um, so using myself as a case example, this is why I am where I am. Um, so my mom was one of those people who kept those little books, you know, where she wrote down, you know, kept my report card and a couple of pieces of artwork. And every year there was a question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, and at age four, I wanted to be a cowboy. At age five, I wanted to be an astronaut. But from age six on, I wanted to be a doctor. So, so I kind of knew what I was interested in really early in life. Um, I always loved science, loved to read, and one of my best friends as a child, that don't laugh, but one of my best friends as a child was actually our world book encyclopedias, which were in our living room. Um, and so anytime I would watch something on TV and it was something I didn't know, um, I would immediately go to the world book and learn about it so that I did know about it the next time I heard it. And this is well before the internet, so I, I don't think anybody even has a world book encyclopedia, but at that time, that was like the reference. Um, I was always involved in science projects. In high school, I was doing genetic crossings of Drosophila strains to look at wing structure and eye color. Uh, in college, I was working on a, um, a project looking at zinc supplementation on natural killer cell activity in mouse models of breast cancer. Uh, in graduate school, I uh, was working with light, white leghorn chickens. Has anybody ever seen a white leghorn chicken? Um, so the roosters are like, almost four feet tall um, and really nasty disposition. We were looking at uh, hormonal manipulation of, of fat metabolism. Um, uh, by high school, I was just really fascinated on, on neuroscience. Um, and, and that all actually got driven home even more so because of this gentleman. So this is my granddad. Uh, this is me as a baby. We can't see your slides. Oh, okay. Why can't you see my slides? Let's see. Let's try this again, let me find here. I'll try this again. There we go. All right. Uh, all right, so, um, so this is my granddad. This is me as a baby. I was the first grandchild in the family. Um, and uh, so my granddad and I, we grew up in a two family home. So we lived on the first floor, they lived on the second floor. And as a kid, I did everything with my granddad. I did things with my dad, of course, but I was very, very close with my granddad. Um, this is me in seventh grade getting confirmed in the Catholic church. This is my granddad. Uh, his name was Edward. You can see on my little sash here, uh, my confirmation name is Edward. Actually, my middle name is Edward as well. So uh, just driving home the point of how close we were. Um, when I was a junior in high school, uh, he used to pick me up from my swim meets and drive me home because um, I went to school close to where he worked. Um, and one day we were driving home and he made the world's slowest left-hand turn um, and we were broadsided by a car. Luckily, no one was injured. Um, but being a junior in high school, I was just starting to drive myself. And uh, I remember turning him and saying, Grandpa, what happened? And he said, I don't know. The car didn't move. Um, and, uh, and that, because I didn't think much of it because I was, you know, 16 years old at the time. Um, and then uh, a couple of months later, um, he was at work. So he was a, a machine oiler, which means he was the one that climbed in and out of the big machines to keep them all running. He worked for Colgate Palmolive and he fell off a ladder and broke his ribs. Uh, so while I was in the emergency room, my grandmother rushed down there and she's talking to my grandfather and the emergency room doctor walks in and says to my grandmother, how long has your husband had Parkinson's disease? And my grandmother's like, what are you talking about? Uh, and he pointed to my grandfather's hand and he had the natural uh, 
pill rolling tremor that's so common in Parkinson's disease. Um, and so then I learned a lot about Parkinson's disease. And by the time my grandfather was in college, he developed dementia um, and started hallucinating. Um, and his memory got quite bad. Uh, and to the point where even though I was now in medical school, he could never place me past college. So he would always ask, you know, what's going on? Um, and then I moved on from medical school into my residency and residency into my fellowship. Um, and when I was in my fellowship, he was now uh, affected with Parkinson's and dementia for over 10 years and was quite severe. Um, he was hallucinating and jumped out of his chair, fell down, broke his hip, had a hip replacement and passed away in the, in the rehab center. So a lot of my academic career focus has been on trying to understand how we can improve dementia outcomes. The point being that is that I made a decision really early on, one, that I wanted to be a medical doctor, but two, I also wanted to be an investigator, uh, which means that I had to think about how to navigate my academic career on top of my clinical activities. Um, and that's very different than being a doctor and seeing patients. Um, so, you know, when I started thinking about this, you know, uh, these are some sort of guideposts. So first, what are others' expectations of you? Uh, what do they expect of you? And what are your expectations from about others and, and for yourself? And I think it's really important to constantly take stock for why there might be differences between others' expectations of you and your expectations and, and why those differences exist. What are the reasons for them? Uh, one thing I will tell you, and that's gonna be a theme throughout uh, the talk here is, um, it's, it's a real mistake to compare yourself or your accomplishments to others because each situation is unique, right? And that's only going to lead to some frustration. So, you know, you may be chugging along at your career, maybe an assistant professor, and you have more papers than a full tenured professor. Um, but you can't go to that P&T committee and say, well, look, I have 12 papers and he has eight papers. Why is he promoted? And I'm getting all these questions. It doesn't work. Right? So you have to look at each situation as its own unique situation. But I think as you sit there and start to take stock, and that's what I really want you to do over the course of this talk is take stock of where you are in your career, is what special skills do you have? What are you willing to learn? What are you not willing to do? Um, and, and again, thinking about how that's all going to be positioned. And, and the last is to find a good mentor. That's really critical. Um, because pursuing an academic career can, is quite challenging. Uh, this is one of the papers that I sent out to you all, um, or Kira sent out to you uh, before this talk. Um, and it talks about sort of the change in attitudes of people to pursue an academic career while they're getting their PhDs. Um, and so in this study, they looked at people in, in a PhD program uh, early in their PhD and then later in their PhD. And so about 80% started off being interested in an academic career and 20% weren't. You can see by the end of their PhD, only 55% remained interested um, in getting an academic career. And of the 20 who were not interested, only five gained an interest. So really there was a net loss of about 20% of PhD candidates uh, interested in pursuing an academic career. Because um, it, it can be a very challenging life. Um, this is one another paper that I sent out. Um, and this is particularly relevant for women in academics. And, and particularly for women in medicine, science, medical sciences, uh, which is quite different than the life sciences. Uh, so this was an interesting study looking at research self-efficacy. Uh, and what they found, one, was that when they compared medical sciences to the life sciences, um, there was significantly lower self-efficacy in the female medical doctoral uh, candidates, but no differences in the life sciences. Uh, and then when they did a regression analysis looking at a whole bunch of factors, Research self-efficacy and first author publications really were related to the overall intention and success of the candidate. So the conclusions from this paper were that female medical science graduates had lower career, uh, academic career aspirations, even when controlling for everything else. So, um, and I noticed, I, and I, one of the reasons I picked this paper because a lot of the Rick Marr scholars happen to be women. Um, and some of you are in life sciences, some of you are in medical sciences, uh, but there are a number of challenges that are different than the challenges that other people may face. Um, and this is the third paper that I sent out, was a, a little pilot project looking at mentorship. 
Um, so mentorship is really essential for someone who wants to consider a future in academic medicine or academics in general. Um, mentoring is really recognized as one of the most important factors that determines career success. Um, a good mentor can take you a long way and a bad mentor can really sort of put you off track and it takes a while to, to reposition. Um, so you really need someone who's going to help you navigate that. Unfortunately, um, the lack of a mentor may stem from never considering one for a lot of trainees or on how to find one or not knowing how they could benefit them or not communicating effectively with one that they may have. Um, so this particular paper actually talks about some skills that could be developed in order to improve mentor-mentee relationships. So again, I encourage you to, to look at some of these papers. Um, so, you know, when I was putting together this talk, thinking about, well, how would I describe a mentor? And so I wanted to go beyond the obvious good mentor, bad mentor. Um, and, and so there are some subtypes of mentors you can think about. So, you know, we'll call type one, you know, the really outstanding scholar scientist, you know, the guy that the, the guy or the woman, the faculty member that everybody wants to aspire to be, publishes lots of papers, gets grants, has a national and or international reputation in, in some area. Um, they tend to be very focused on their own success, but they're very willing to have people ride their coattails so, so they can sort of take you along and you can go along for the journey on that. Another type of mentor is really the compassionate listener. So this person's moved up the ladder successfully and, and they may not have the robust CV that the type one mentor has, but they're very interested in helping you succeed. And so they see your success as their success, right? And so, so that's another type of relationship. And the third type of relationship is sort of the external source. That person may be at another university, you could have met at a meeting and hit it off. And, and they're always willing to sort of lend an ear that you can bounce ideas off of. Someone you can call and say, I just need advice. And, and they're always there for you. And they expect very little in return because again, you're not directly working together. But they could be a really great source for connections or letters of recommendation, particularly when you're going up for promotion. Uh, now, one thing I want you to realize that these two are, these three types are not mutually exclusive. You can be an outstanding scholar scientist and a compassionate listener and a really good source for helping people move along. So you can find those people. And luckily, in your program here, you have those people, people who actually fit all those things. But in the course of your other interactions, you may find people that fit one piece of what you need from a mentor, but not the other pieces. So you have to build a team of mentors really to, to help you succeed. So, so let's use our case study. So in 2006, there was this lowly assistant professor who was attempting to get promoted. Um, this person had just finished two career development awards, a K-08 from NIH and a Beeson Physician Faculty Scholar Award from the American Federation of Aging Research. Not only finished the grants, but finished the no cost extensions and was faced with a dilemma. There was a significant downturn in NIH funding. When this individual, who happens to be me, uh, started their K award, the pay line for NIH grants was in the low 20th percentile. When I finished my K awards, the pay line was single digits. Okay, so it's one thing to write a 20th percentile grant, it's a very different thing to write a sixth percentile grant. Okay, um, and I was struggling, right? I was struggling to maintain both a basic science lab, I was a cell biologist as well as diving into sort of clinical translational research with an interest in health disparities. Um, and, I, and I came to face to face with the reality that to really advance, I needed to step back and sort of take stock of a situation, okay? Um, and here are the facts. My division chief was concerned. My chair was concerned, um, which led me to be concerned. Um, uh, and, and so I had to really think about this. Uh, and so one of the things I did is I actually started, I was a scientist, right? And so, well, how does a scientist look at data? They look at plots, right? So I actually plotted my career up to this point. Um, so here were the years from 1997 to 2005. Remember, this is early 2006 when I'm doing this. I finished my residency in 96. So in 97, I did a postdoc year. Um, and I moved to my first faculty spot at my institution I did my residency training in. Um, 
So, so I was there. And so these are my publications. And so I had set a goal that I needed to have four papers per year. That was my goal. That's what I wanted to achieve. And I thought if I could publish four papers per year, I would be successful. Um, and, and so, you know, I hit that four paper per year in 1999. Um, and, uh, couple of the papers were very high profile journals. Um, I presented this data at meetings. People came up to me at the meetings, started talking to me, and I realized, gee, I could actually move institutions and move from a relatively low tier institution into a more prominent institution. And I thought that would be good. And so um, at that point, I moved from Hahnemann University in Philadelphia to Washington University in St. Louis. I will tell you that on July 1st, 2000, I became instantly smarter than I was at June 30th, 2000. Um, so everybody started to look at me different because I had changed institutions. Uh, and so that move was good for me. It got me interacting with a lot of people, but there was a downside to a move. One downside is that everything you were doing at one institution, you can't just take and continue to work. So you can see there was a little downturn in, in my, my goal publications, right? Um, but I continued to be diligent and worked at it and started to build the framework in order to do my work. Um, and then I got awarded uh, two career development awards. So I am the only person in the history of these two awards to have both a Beeson from AFAR and a Marquee K08 from NIH. These two programs later combined to be the new Beeson K01, K23, right? But when I did it, there were two separate programs. I'm the only person to have both of these awards. The downside, they were both three-year awards. So three years is a very short time to do career development. But I plugged away. So in 2005, 2006, when I'm taking stock and talking to my division chief and talking to my uh, chair, um, I looked at my publications and something became clear to me. And that is almost all of my high profile publications were in my clinical translational work. And although I considered myself to be a good cell biologist, the rest of the world didn't. Um, and, and so I really had to take stock of that. So, so I sat back and looked and my productivity really reflected my clinical research activities and not my basic lab efforts. I was struggling to keep the lab open, or running, uh, and it was diluting my productivity in other areas. My chair and my section chief valued my clinical research projects greatly, um, but not so much my basic science. Um, all my invitations on the national forum were based on my clinical research accomplishments. So taking stock, the result was I wanted to refocus my efforts and concentrate on building my clinical research career. So this is my first sort of take stock moment, okay? When I took stock, then I started to look and see what was happening, right? So I focused my efforts, my productivity increased. Now these are all clinical translational papers. Um, those papers translated into me being able to take my projects to the next level. I developed the AD8, which is the venture screening tool that's used in over 27 countries. Um, we get lots of licensing dollars from this, um, but I was able to do that because I was able to focus. I started getting positions and promotions so I was uh, made the director of the dementia clinics, okay? Um, and then in 2007, remember my case study started in 2006. In 2007, I got promoted to associate professor. So uh, good thing. Um, so I got promoted and I stopped back and said, well, why did I get promoted? Well, one, I started actually listening to advice. Now I can be stubborn at times. Um, and I know no one on this call is ever stubborn, right? You're all really open-minded. You always listen to everything your elders tell you. Um, but for me, I actually had to start to listen to people. Um, <clears throat> it allowed me to sort of refine my research career and focusing on clinical translational work. I closed my basic science lab. <clears throat> I started dabbling in clinical trials. This then increased not only my national presence, but now an international presence. Okay. And I use that creativity to then expand our dementia clinics. Okay. Um, and this is one of these things that you need to do, right? You need to develop a metric that can demonstrate your value to those people around you. Okay. <clears throat> so in this case, I'm a physician as well as a scientist. So I'm going to show you a clinical metric that I created, but you, you could really think about this in any way. 
So the arrows represent where I became head of the clinics. This is patient office visits. So in 2005, the prior director uh, was running it and they were averaging about 600 visits a year. I took over in 2006, 2006, 2007, 2008. You can see a steady increase. This is half of 2009. And we already were already almost at the same level at all of 2005, right? So I was able to take my knowledge and my skills and my understanding of everything, right? Learn a little bit more about the business of medicine, right? And I was able to double our patient visits and I was able to double our gross charges, okay? So if you wanna ever sit with your chair and talk about what you contribute to the department, doubling patient visits and doubling dollars is gonna get their attention, right? And so this is a metric that I was able to carry with me, okay? So step back and review. I utilize my strength to develop programs. I piloted feasibility for new programs. I really focused on publishing in high profile journals, right? So I avoided things that were in throwaway journals where possible and really focused on having better science going to higher profile journals. So it was being cited more. Um, I learned to talk about my accomplishments and we're gonna come back and talk about this, but I learned to talk about my accomplishments, my skills, my strengths and my limitations, right? So when I, I learned to understand my limitations. I don't think about myself as having weaknesses. My weaknesses are strengths which are not fully matured, okay? I look at them at limitations and I have come up with alternative strategies to overcome those limitations. And what I did for those years, right, was to create a vision for what I would do if I was provided with resources. And then I made the pitch of what I could do provided with resources. And that resulted in a new job and another promotion. So I moved from, N from WashU to NYU uh, in 2010. <clears throat> and so again, just sort of tracking my productivity, um, I became a core leader for our Alzheimer's Center. Um, we started getting a lot of revenue for those tests that I developed in 2006. Now people were licensing, licensing them. Um, and so people started calling me um, and I got recruited to several universities. I wound up going to NYU, was promoted to full professor. So remember, I was assistant professor from 98 through 2006. I got promoted to associate professor and four years later, I was promoted to professor. Um, I was able then to take that, right? And think about focusing my projects on health disparities. And I got my first R01, which is on multicultural communities and dementia. Again, moved to a new place, had a new job, thought about creating new metrics. So BGAG is before Galvin and after Galvin. Um, and so I uh, was directing the Barlow Center for Memory Disorders. Um, and it was a multi or transdisciplinary clinic. So we had social workers, we had neurologists, psychiatrists, uh, we had a neuropsychologist. Um, so, so really interdisciplinary. Um, and again, you can see that um, yeah, we had a 14% increase in the charges, but here's what really drew people's attention was we had a 217% increase in the amount of money we were being paid, right? And so before I took over, I'm looking at what's happening. I'm saying, well, why aren't we making any money? And the reason we we're making any money is no one was actually filling out the charge sheets, right? And no one had bothered to think about this. Like, you know, how do we collect the charge sheet? Um, so spent a lot of time, in the back office side, trying to think about procedures and policies and developing SOPs and a manual of operations, just like you do for a research project and applied it to a clinic. And what we found is we actually started collecting money for the work we started doing. Again, that catches people's notice and you start to be recognized as someone who can be of value to an institution. So, you know, I had assumed a departmental leadership position. I utilized those strengths to develop new programs for other people. So before I was developing programs for myself, now I was developing programs for other people, right? Started mentoring early stage investigators, helping them get started on their K awards. Um, I rebuilt a failed clinical program and I took on the task of revamping and improving an existing research center, right? So now I had shown a vision and implemented on what I would do when I was provided with resources, 
right? So before I had a vision of what I would do if someone would give me resources. And now I showed what I could do once I got resources, okay? Um, and that got other people's attention. And the result of that was a new job and another promotion. So I moved from NYU to FAU, right? And I was brought in as the Associate Dean for Clinical Research, okay? Um, and one of the things we did is so FAU was a new medical school. It was only six years old when I first moved there. They had, no one was practicing. So it was a medical school without a single practice. So I actually created the very first practice for the university and built this collaborative care model, um, which we then published on to show how you would build a collaborative care model, right? And so it involved medical assistants, nurse practitioner, physical therapists, social workers, physicians, and we had this whole coordination of care model. So I had a flow sheet and how we would collect money for each of these flow sheets and demonstrated how we could build something from nothing, okay? Um, uh, and so then what we did was like, wow, that's really cool. So they gave us space, right? Space is king in an institution. Titles, eh, don't mean a whole lot, uh, but space is king. Right, uh, and so we got this 7,000 square foot space. Uh, and these are the two entities I created. One was the Comprehensive Center for Brain Health, which was my lab, right? And remember I said, I create programs for other people, our clinical translational research unit, right? Which essentially was our version of a CTSI, okay? Um, and then I hired a staff, right? And the staff had lots of different skills and were able to really build out the operation um, and grow. Um, and that was really valuable. So again, kind of taking stock and reviewing, I had now assumed not a departmental leadership position, but a university leadership position. I was associate dean for research and the executive director for the Institute for Healthy Aging. Okay. This allowed me now to begin to recruit new faculty, right? Um, my prior mentees who had their K awards were now getting their first R01s. Okay. I was now mentoring new early stage investigators to their K awards, right? I created this clinical translational research unit. I developed this first clinical practice at the medical school. And now I was implementing a vision to show you what I could do when there were no resources, right? So first I talked about what I would do if you gave me resources. Then I would show you what you did, what I would do when I got resources. And then moving to FAU where there were no resources, I could show you what I could do when there were no resources, right? So in each stage, right, the idea is take stock of what you're doing, what are your successes, what are your fa failures, what do you learn from your failures? Your, fa your failures aren't a failure, your failures are just successes that didn't happen, right? And so how could you look at that failure and see what are what's the bright side of it, right? How do you make, you know, lemonade from lemons? or as the chair of my department would say, how do you make chicken salad out of chicken shit, right? The idea is how do you look at everything and try to figure out what you can do? Um, and again, people took notes of that and that led from to a new job and increased opportunities. So now looking at my academic publications uh, and the productivity, you know, by focusing and rethinking and rethinking and rethinking and rethinking and taking stock and changing things that needed to be changed, you can see that you can slowly start to see the progression. This dotted line was that four paper per year margin that I had set for myself very early in my career. Okay. And here's what my productivity looks like now, right? It's somewhere between 20 and 40 papers a year. Um, so I was associate dean, I got my second R01, I moved to the University of Miami, I got my third R01, this past year I got my fourth and fifth R01, okay? Um, so that's great, that's my story. Now, how do you apply my story to you, right? So I said, get metrics. So one thing is find out where you stand and figure out where you are in the world and how you could demonstrate to others where you are. So you wanna track indices. One such indice is something called the H index. So this is an author level metric that measures productivity and citation impact, right? A higher H index corresponds with success, okay? It doesn't mean success, but it corresponds to success, right? Um, it really sort of captures the output and it standardizes it into a metric, right? So if a person has 15 papers, all of which were cited 15 times, their H index is 15, okay? 
if you write 100 papers and no one ever cites your papers, your H index is zero, okay? Um, Einstein's H index when he was alive would have been two, okay? His H index now is over a thousand because people still cite his papers even though he's been long dead, okay? Um, so it's all relative, but the idea is it's a metric and people understand that metrics. So it is useful for things. It allows you to compare yourself to researchers of a similar career length and that allows you to compare yourself to researchers in a similar field who publish in the same type of journals, okay? So it gets you a snapshot of how you're performing, but it's also not useful for things. So you can't compare yourself to a researcher in an entirely different discipline. So I'm in neuroscience. I can't compare myself with an H index to someone in sociology, okay? because their output looks different, right? Um, it, it might be on books or conferences or monographs, and those things aren't captured in the same way, so it's not a direct comparison. Uh, but within your field, it can be very useful. So on average, uh, uh, an ordinary assistant professor who has an H index of two to five, an associate professor, six to 10, a full professor, 12 to 24. Okay. That's on average. There'll be people higher, there'll be people lower. Okay. Other thing is you got to learn to talk about yourself. Okay. Um, most researchers are truly horrible at telling other people, particularly lay audiences, what the heck they're doing. Right. So no one really understands what you do. Um, and, but scientists are just terrible at discussing the importance of their findings. Um, they do a really terrible job of it, right? So, so I grew up in New Jersey. My grandmother is now going to be 100. Um, and I find that if I can explain to her what I'm doing and she can understand what I'm doing, then I can explain it to anybody, right? So the idea is that you got to learn to talk about yourself and what you do. You also need to learn to talk to the media and the press so they know what you do. And guess what? Then they'll start to call on you as a content expert, okay? Um, so what you really should do is practice telling people in one minute what you do, what you found, why it's important, why it matters, and why you are the best person to do it without any audio visual. And if you want to learn how to do that, go to Amazon and buy this book. Okay, it's $10, uh, Escape from the Ivory Tower. Now there's other books called Escape from the Ivory Tower, which are like fantasies about escaping from a tower. I'm not talking about this, right? Um, it's an older book. It's, I think 2010 was the last press, but it's totally worth it. It's a guide to making your science matter. Very easy to understand and tells you how to talk to, talk up to people about your science, right? Um, so, because the goal here is really, you're all really smart people, but not everybody knows how smart you are. Um, and so how do you become an expert so that people understand what, what you're doing? The advantage of becoming an expert is that when you go and write grants, people will say, ooh, this is that grant from that expert in this field, right? And so, you know, one of your scores is a investigator score where they, they score you as the investigator. And if you're an expert, then people are gonna take that seriously, right? So what is an expert, right? I, I often ask people, people this. So I'm going to ask a couple of you. Um, so Patrick, tell me, what is an expert? Give me the definition of an expert. You're on me. Okay. Who has, oh, I'm going to use the word expertise. So <laughs> somebody who has expertise within a particular field. Okay. All right. So Maz, what's, what's an expert? Tell me your definition of an expert. I almost was going to use the word expertise because All right. <laughs> the first rule of defining things is not to use the word in the definition, yeah. but that's okay. I'll let you do it here because I'm putting you on the spot. What's a, what's what's an expert? So a person who has expertise in a very particular topic within a discipline. Okay. Uh, I would okay. say. Uh, Wei, what's an expert? Person who is a who has authority over the, the subject that we are talking about. Okay. All right. Not bad. Not bad. So how do you become an expert? Luciana, how do you become an expert? 
uh, I think studying a lot and having experience with, uh, the field you are uh, getting your expertise. <laughs> okay, right. So, so in many ways, what an expert is and how you become one is basically telling everybody that you're an expert, okay? Um, so for example, is this guy an expert? You know, some guy just standing on the street corner and holding up a sign. Doesn't matter what the sign says. This one says, stop standing when the plane lands, right? But he's just some dude standing on the corner holding up a sign, right? Um, and so is he an expert? I don't know, right? But you know, if I went to this different street corners throughout the city and I kept seeing this guy standing there with a sign, so here he is with another sign, make a holiday for single people. You know, here he is with another sign. That meeting could have been an email. Um, how about this one? Stop wearing t-shirts of bands you don't listen to. Um, or this one, stop doing sponsored ads. At some point, people are gonna say, hey, this guy is an expert. And people are going to start to take notice. And then when you take notice, good things can happen. Like this guy actually showed up on Jimmy Fallon. Okay. And so this dude with a sign standing on a street corner in New York City got noticed and then appeared on Jimmy Fallon. He now is an expert. And guess what? Dude with a sign has 5.7 million Instagram followers. Okay. Think about that. His only expertise possibly is being able to stand on a street corner with a sign. So he defined himself as an expert. There's no reason why you can't define yourself as an expert in your field, but you have to learn how to talk about what you do to other people. Okay. So I'm going to tell you the story of Little Red Riding Hood, and I'm going to tell you it in two different ways. Okay? And the reason I'm going to tell you it is because I'm going to put you in the situation where you happen to be standing in the lobby of a building next to Bill Gates. And for whatever reason, Bill Gates turns next to you and say, hey, I'm Bill Gates. You know, who are you and what do you do? And the elevator door opens and you both step into the elevator. Right. And so you have from the time the elevator door closes to the time the elevator door opens again, to tell him what you are, what you do, why it's important, okay? Here is how most of you would tell the story of Little Red Riding Hood. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago in a land far, far away, there lived a little girl named Little Red Riding Hood. She was called Little Red Riding Hood because she always wore a Little Red Riding Hood. Now, Little Red Riding Hood lived with her grandmother and every day Little Red Riding Hood would traipse off into the woods to gather something new and interesting for her grandmother. Sometimes it was flowers, sometimes it was berries, sometimes it was ding. Door opens, Bill turns to you and say, hey, nice meeting you, and leaves. Okay? Here's how I tell the story of Little Red Riding Hood. The wolf ate grandma. Now, if you've never heard the little story of Little Red Riding Hood, this means nothing to you. But this is the pivotal point in the story, right? because the wolf ate grandma, right? And the rest of the story is all about how Little Red Riding Hood got grandma out of the wolf's stomach, right? And the key point is that I went right to the heart of the matter. I went to the essence of the story and I told someone an interesting fact about what I found and why it's important. And if I says this to Bill Gates, what's he gonna, what's he gonna turn and say to me? Really? Tell me more. Okay, and so I've established myself not only as an expert, but with a story to tell, and I told it in five words. Okay, so the idea is how could you engage people? And so this is a skill that you just need to practice if you want to really be successful. Because how do you say something is, it, is as important as what you say. Okay. So you really want to learn how to advertise and promote yourself. So if you haven't done this, create a website, okay? Um, you don't want to be a, just a little link on the department website. You want to work to having your own site, your own URL. It allows you to describe you and your research program, to promote your major findings, to recruit participants, to encourage philanthropic support. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, you know, if you like this thing, you, know, you can do social media, right? Twitter, Facebook, 
You know, if you have enough content, you can build a YouTube channel. Um, you can also look at social interaction sites, ResearchGate, LinkedIn, ways of making connections with other people with similar interest. Create a profile for yourself on Google Scholar and populate a site on Web of Science. Now, the difference between the two is that Google Scholar, once you create the profile, it'll load everything on it for you. And all you have to do is subtract stuff that's not actually you. Um, whereas Web of Science does a terrible job of finding stuff about you and you have to kind of manually load it. So it's a lot more work. It's a better site, but it's a lot more work. Um, but but, but one, one caveat, remember what's out in the web is always out in the web. So don't put anything in any of these things that you don't want other people to know about because it'll never ever go away. It's always there and it can always be found, okay? So this is my Google Scholar site. It's nice, you know, you put your academic institution, you can load up a, a photograph, right? You can see how many people are following you. Um, you know, here's all your papers. Uh, it lists your collaborators. It can cross-reference your collaborators. And you can see right here, it generates your H index and your I10 index for you right there. So it does everything for you. Web of Science is a lot harder, right? Um, it, it much more difficult. So I have 286 papers. Web of Science only found 70 of them. So I have to manually load to over two, almost two, over 200 papers into Web of Science, which is a pain in the neck. So I do it, but I, it's very slow. Here's another interesting and important factoid. Um, learn to say no. Okay. Over the course of your career, you will be asked by your supervisor, your division chief, your chair, your dean, somebody to do things. Many of these things you don't want to do. And junior people get asked to do these things disproportionately to senior people. You know why? Because senior people have learned to say no, okay? So before agreeing to do anything, ask yourself the following two questions. Question number one, does it bring you fame, fortune, or power, okay? So by fame, I'm talking about things like international reputation, publications, grants, fortune, a higher salary, more money in your pocket's good. Um, a promotion, which can lead to more money in your pocket, that's good, or more grant dollars, also quite good. Or power, would you go into a leadership position or get more grant dollars? Or you can ask question number two, does it generate goodwill that you can bank and cash in at a later time? Okay. If you can't answer yes to either question, I would suggest that you consider to politely decline the wonderful opportunity that you were afforded. Okay because spending lots of time doing lots of other things is gonna detract from your ability to be successful, okay? Um, and your promotion is gonna depend on things like grants, publications, um, and citizenship. So don't say no to everything, but that's where to generate the goodwill you can bank later comes into play, okay? So I, I think one of the challenges is that we get easily distracted, right? And so we want to get on a path and we want to follow a path, okay? Um, and so Jadon knows this because I've used this analogy with him and that's why he kind of used it in his presentation is, as I say, follow the yellow brick road, okay? Um, and so, but, you know, you want to follow a path. Now, this is not actually a picture of the yellow brick road. This is a yellow brick road, but it's not the yellow brick road, okay? Um, I'm going to assume that many of you have seen the movie Wizard of Oz. Okay, so if you have seen it, then think about what's actually right next to the yellow brick road. If you haven't seen it, then you'll have to follow along with the story, but you won't really get the, the, the connotation, okay? So when Dorothy lands in Munchkin, Munchkinville, right, Munchkin Lounge, and she has to start, they tell her to follow the yellow brick road. But next to the yellow brick road actually is a red brick road. And so when Dorothy starts right in this spot, she gets told to follow the yellow brick road. But, you know, there is another path. And she gets reminded constantly by the little munchkins who pop out and tell her to follow the yellow brick road, follow the yellow brick road, right? And the reason they're telling that is they want her to follow the yellow brick road because the yellow brick road is the path that's going to get her to where she needs to go. But I'm a curious kind of guy. And so I started thinking about this red path. 
And, and when I start thinking about something, I get stuck on it and I need to kind of pursue it to its logical end. And so, you know, where does this red path actually go? What happens if Dorothy just didn't listen um, and she decided to, you know, follow her own path and chose the red brick path? Well, if you zoom out a little bit, and this is when Dorothy meets Glinda in the beginning of the movie, um, you can see the yellow path is kind of leading out, but the red path seems to be winding back, really can't see where it goes. But if you zoom out a little bit more, you can see that the red path brick road actually leads sort of through Munchkinville. Um, and, and so, so I wanted to know, I mean, I, I needed to know. And so I spent hours upon hours researching the red brick road uh, because that's what I do. Um, and so I found a map, a very secret map in a deep archive. You know, I had to pay off people to get this map. Um, and so if you follow the red brick road, it leads you to the Lullaby League and the Lollipop Guild. Um, and if you think about it, if you spend a lot of your time sleeping and eating lollipops, probably not going to get very far in your career. The other thing is, besides having houses land on you, because that seems to be a real problem in Oz, um, is that the red brick road also takes you to the coroner's house. So, you know, taking a wrong path really can be a dead end in a literal sense. You want to follow the yellow brick roads because it's going to take you there. But realize as you go along the yellow brick road, there'll be forks in the road and you need to think about what path you're going to take and how you're going to get there. So these are really important decisions you need to make. And this is where your mentors can really come into play. Now, hopefully your mentor is not a brainless scarecrow who doesn't really know which way to go, but hopefully your mentor can guide you that one path may be the wiser path than the other path. And then if you follow the yellow brick road, you can actually find your fame, fortune, and power. So go back to our case report, right? And so this is me where I am at the moment, right? Um, you know, I have 286 publications. My H, H index is 62. You know, I'm well known internationally in the areas of Alzheimer's and cognitive aging, but I also have other things that I do and people appreciate that. And I get called to help with these things. So I have a national reputation in interprofessional education interventions and program development and evaluation. So when someone's looking for a way of looking at something, they often call me and I can help them. And that's kind of cool. And I'll show you why that helps. Um, I, I develop instruments. So I was trained in psychometric theory. And so I own 15 copyrights and two patents and have screening tools used in 27 countries and have generated over a million dollars in licensing fees. Um, you know, I like team science. I think that's the way to go. I spent a lot of time learning a lot of skills and I've been funded by a lot of organizations. One of the first things I learned is you have to build a good team. So you have team science is really the way to go. So think about how you build your team, not just in your own lab, but how you're gonna to connect to people in your institution and other institutions across the country and internationally, right? And how you can leverage those relationships to really become amazing right, and, and do great things. You want to get research support, right? So start off thinking small and then think big. Don't think big too fast because if you get ahead of yourself, you'll just be disappointed, right? Um, so maybe look for internal funds. They're generally less competitive, but they're not going to count toward p and They're not going to count at all toward promotion and tenure. Then look at disease associations and foundations, generally small pots of money with limited IDC, indirect costs, deans like indirect costs. Um, they also generally don't count toward your p &T. Philanthropy is great. That's where that elevator talk comes into play, right? Because these will get you unrestricted funds, chairs, endowments, and they'll pay for a lot of things that are not covered by grants, but they're also probably not gonna count toward p &T. But all of those early dollars help you build an infrastructure. Once you build an infrastructure, you can go to the next step, which is a career development type of award, right? So a KO1, a KO8, a KL2, doesn't matter, there's lots of these out there. These are two to five year awards. What they do is they cover your effort, which is really great. You get 75% protected time. You can do a lot of things with protected time, but you do need to find ways of covering the other 25%. If you're an MD, that might mean a day of clinic. If you're a PhD, that might mean a 1-1 course load or something like that. But there's actually a very small budget to actually conduct the research in case, right? So you're going to rely heavily on your mentor. And that's where building that mentor relationship is going to be really critical, right? Then you could start look at these small grants like R21s and R03s. These are small awards that let you do exploratory work. 
Um, they're a nice bridge, but in my opinion, they're kind of difficult to get. But if you can get them, they're really good because it kind of shows growth from a K to an, a, a low R, right? The nice thing about it, it doesn't affect your ESI status, your early stage investigator status. And this is critical because you get a bump being an ESI, okay? So this is the pay line for 2021 for NIA. Um, and you can see the general pay line is about 8%. Um, for ESI, it's 13%. If you're doing Alzheimer work, the pay line is 28% up to 33%. So the first lesson here is that Alzheimer research pays right now, right? Because the pay line is roughly four times bigger for Alzheimer projects than for the general pay line, okay? Um, and the general allocation is taking an 18% pay cu uh, a cut, a budget cut. So you get a million dollars, they take 18% away. Whereas the Alzheimer allocation is not being cut. So a lot of advantages to doing ADRD work right now. So getting research support, the next stage, right, is to think about how you can be part of other people's grants, right? Because this also does not affect your ESI and gets you salary support, very, very valuable, right? Because the more time you can spend not having to do all those things you don't want to do, the more you can focus on building your research career. Right? And you can get varying amount of efforts. And there are two different ways to do this. You could, you could carry out a specific task. They need you to do this thing. That's good. They'll give you 10% for doing a, a clinical assessment or a neuropsych test or um, a structured interview. Okay? Or this is where that content expert comes into play. If you're the content expert, they may need your expertise for them to get their grant. So they're going to pay you just for your brain and nothing else. That's even better because it's free money, right? So you're going to be there for their support and help them as they're doing their project. They don't need you to do their project. They need you so they can get their money, right? And that's where the expertise really comes into play. And then you're going to go on, hopefully, and get your R01s or equivalents, right? And these are five-year awards. They carry more money. They're the gold standard for promotion and tenure bring in lots of IDC, deans love IDC. They are a little of a challenge to budget your effort though, right? Um, because it's hard to exceed 50% um, on a, an R01. So you may need more than one, but you, what you do is you wanna cobble together a diverse yet focused research portfolio, right? So this is what my portfolio looks like at the moment, right? Um, so I'm the PI for two R01s, I'm the MPI on five other grants, and I'm a site PI where I'm the content expert guy on a whole bunch of other grants, right? So my current portfolio is I take in about $6 million annual direct costs, just my lab. Um, so no one bothers me. They leave me alone, let me do work, and I get to do fun things like give you lectures. So to summarize, first, define your niche, learn your niche, love your niche, Make sure everyone else knows your niche. Make sure others know that you are the expert in your niche, right? Read the P&T guidelines at your institution and speak with recently promoted faculty. So each institution is unique. Learn what you need to do by learning the rules of the road. Publish, publish, publish. And when you're done with that, publish some more, right? Um, social network, it's really the way that people are meeting today. Um, it's a little bit different um, than when I started off. Um, get money when you can, how you can, um, and think about how you can, can collaborate with people. Um, develop metrics that help you demonstrate your value. Learn to speak about yourself. This is absolutely critical. You have to learn to speak about yourself. And be prepared to move because sometimes that's what it's going to take. Um, I will end right there. Um, Happy to um, happy to take any questions that people may have. I hope you found it uh, informative and hopefully a little bit entertaining. No, that was absolutely clear to everybody. That's great. So I expect to see all your promotion packages prepared by the end of the week. Jim, I have a question. Oh. Go, go ahead. No, no, it's not about question. Just, I just want to say, like, this is so help, helpful and very informative. I mean, 
you know, it's really clear about what I need to do for my career. So thank you, Jim, for this amazing presentation. Wei, you had a talk? Uh, great talk. Thank you for the wisdom. And question for you, and as a clinician scientist, right, it's, it's kind of challenging for us because our path is a little bit different. We're walking in the middle, uh, you know, especially for surgeons, where we are not really a 100% uh, clinician versus a 100% researcher. And I think uh, finding a good mentor is the key, right? So, and, you know, I have multiple mentors uh, and stuff, but uh, do you have any advice on uh, who we should find to guide your career? And obviously there are a lot of uh, different changes for your career uh, with, you know, institution move and all this stuff. Right. Well, that's why I kind of described there are different types of people who could be your mentors. Um, and so having a, a collection of mentors is valuable. You might find someone who meets all of those, you know, check boxes, but actually you might not. Right. Um, and so, um, you know, there's the person who's like super successful and that's what you might strive to be. And, and again, they're happy to sort of take you along for the ride, but that they don't really provide a lot of career guidance or direct career guidance, right? So my first R01 application, I had one of, I had a s Academy of, you know, you know, Institute of Science, Institute of Medicine uh, person um, review it, right? Um, and I got back a whole bunch of comments and the comments were just a little bot. This is back when, you know, mostly we're writing comments on the margin of the paper, right? It was like, so what? Didn't understand could be explained better. To me, that wasn't helpful mentorship because I don't know, I don't know what I could have done better because I don't know what I did wrong, right? Um, so I learned from him a couple of things, right? And so again, Jadon has a little experience with this. You know, I keep asking questions of so what, right? Um, but I usually follow it up with some more in-depth questions. So I learned from my mentors, both good and bad about you know, what to do and how to help. So cobbling together a mentor team is really critical. You know, identify some people who, who are what you aspire to be and reach out to them uh, and see if you can connect with them. That's where that external person can be really helpful because they don't have the burden of being your primary mentor and all of that takes, but they might be a really good resource. I found a couple of these people and as I was looking for jobs at different institutions, I would call them and just talk to them and, and you know, voice opinions and get thoughts and feedback ideas. Um, and that really helped me kind of figure out what I needed to do in order to, to move on. What do you look for in a mentees? So do you uh, take on the 100% of people that approach and email you and uh, ask you to be a mentor? Um, more or less, um, you know, so I'm primary mentor on for, for several people. So I have, so let's see, um, my, I have two mentees with KO1s right now. My former KO1 mentees all have RO1s. And actually I'm a, I'm a content expert on their RO1s. Um, so I, I help, it, it helped them to get their RO1s, even though I don't have to really do much of anything other than uh, bounce ideas off of. Um, and then I, you know, I, I serve in mentor roles like I do for Jadon with the, the Rick Mar. I mean, I'm not his, I'm not his primary mentor in the classic sense where, you know, we're working on the same project together, but I'm trying to provide him career mentorship as part of the Rick Mar program. Um, you know, I am part of uh, the pilot team for the U54 Impact Award. Um, and so, if you get a if you get a pilot from U fifty the U fifty four impact, then you get assigned a mentor, and we're supposed to sort of mentor guide you through the world of pragmatic clinical trials. Right? I'm not your primary research mentor. You have one of those. What I'm doing is providing advice to get you through the pragmatic part of it. Right? Um, so so I think you know if you like if people like to do mentor, they they provide mentorship, and sometimes it's just. It's not really anything other than I have a question. Can you give me an opinion? And, and I'm never short on opinions, right? So, um, so I'm happy to share those at all times under any circumstance. So,
All right. Well, I want to be mindful of, of everybody's uh, of time. So we went a little bit over. We started a little bit late. We went a little bit older, over. Um, so I hope you found this informative. Again, the idea was a little bit outside the box. We're not talking about like research directly, but I do think it's just so important as you're launching your careers to kind of understand how to figure out your journey. Your journey is your journey. It's unique to you. What I tried to provide you was how to set some, some milestones for your journey to guide you, okay? Um, so anyway, I hope you found this uh, helpful.